please welcome you in this new interview of 30 Minutes With, a series of interviews with African academics, artists, policy makers, and this to discuss current African issues. We are in Accra, Ghana, and we are going to start a, a series of interviews with African designers, um, activists, and to start with, we have uh, someone that is no longer to be introduced in the Ghanaian intellectual if I may say, uh, scene. Uh, he's the coordinator of Third World Network Africa, a Pan-African research and advocacy organization based in Accra, Ghana. Third World Network covers the areas of economic policy, international trade, investment, and the role of international financial institutions on African development, gender and development, and economic policy. Uh, especially uh, they focus on the mining sector. Uh, our guest today has been involved in activism and written extensively on Africa and global development issues since the mid-1970s, working with key organizations such as trade unions over the years. He is a member of the Coordinating Committee of Social Watch and the Africa editor of the Review of African Political Economy, Europe, and he holds a doctoral degree from Warwick University. So I am pleased to introduce Dr. Yao Gra. Welcome, Dr. Gra. Good morning. And thank you for having us today in thank your you. office of uh, Third World Network. We are very pleased that you were able to accept yeah. our invite to have this interview. So it's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you after so many. <laughs> so we met in uh, Senegal at IDEP when I was working there. And Dr. Graham uh, delivered uh, several trainings and did a monthly development seminars on, uh, on the Africa Mining Vision, actually. Yes. So today we are here to discuss Ghana's development challenges, and I think we will more extensively talk about Africa's development challenges. And to start with, could you please tell us more about yourself, your background, yeah. uh, the circumstances in which you created uh, Third World Network, you co-founded it. Fellow Network Africa was uh, founded in 1994, maybe it came into existence mm -hmm. in, in 1994, mm -hmm. but the discussions about this started slightly earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, initiative was primarily driven by a gentleman called Charles Abu Gray, who had some experience of uh, the NGO scene mm -hmm. in Ghana and internationally. Mm -hmm. Uh, who also had contact with Thero Network uh, globally. But the group of us who founded Thero Network have been variously associated, mm -hmm. you know, on the Ghanaian left, uh, through the student movement, mm -hmm. through mass politics mm -hmm. in the early 80s, who had all distanced ourselves from the Rawlings regime, mm -hmm. which in the early 80s, you know, showed mm -hmm. some progressive promise, but we all fell out with it. But we remain interested in how we could continue to work, mm -hmm. you know, around the things that we were committed to. And at the time, the where group of us were in London, and the conversations were really about what would be the best mm -hmm. organizational form mm -hmm. through which to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the political situation liberalized mm -hmm. uh, in the in the early eighties, uh, the idea of a policy research and advocacy organization looked like uh, like an interesting uh, kind of vehicle. So that's how we came to, to create the World Network as one of a complex mm -hmm. of organizations which will work together. Mm -hmm. So for example, we also set up a, a public interest law mm -hmm. organization called CEPIL mm -hmm. to provide pro bono legal services. Mm -hmm. We set up two publications, African Agenda, mm -hmm. uh, as a Pan-African uh, magazine. Mm -hmm. And we also set up a public agenda mm -hmm. as a domestic newspaper, all of which were supposed to work together, you know, uh, uh, on, on these issues. And then there was a domestic NGO, mm -hmm. ISODEC. Mm -hmm. So this constellation of organizations represented, mm -hmm. you know, what we thought would uh, together mm -hmm. be able to work. Mm -hmm. But personally, my, my entry into the NGO space really was, uh, was a curious kind of evolution uh, because I'd come out of the political movement first as a student activist uh, in the University of Ghana in the 70s, even going back to secondary school and interest in Pan-African and domestic. Just issues about social justice and fairness, you know, the way it usually starts, a kind of a, a bit of moral outrage, a bit of ethical 
you know, concern, and then it becomes a bit more philosophical as you read. Mm -hmm. And the university was was very important mm -hmm. in that because then you began to get into trying to get, get some intellectual, mm -hmm. as it were, grade, mm -hmm. you know, for for the way you feel. Mm -hmm. uh, began to take part in some of the early attempts at building mm -hmm. organization. Then of course I went as a student uh, to, to England, mm -hmm. uh, where in terms of my own uh, academic work also, and being in the UK at a time when the last stages of the National Liberation Movement mm -hmm. were still evolving around uh, mm -hmm. Southern Africa, mm -hmm. at the time when you know Central Africa was the time of progressive, you know, kind of upset, it was, was a great time mm -hmm. uh, for, for my own kind of uh, formation. Mm -hmm. But I think critical in my development was a decision I took uh, in uh, 1982, mm -hmm. after Jerry Rawlings returned to power, mm -hmm. I decided to get my PhD mm -hmm. and come back to Ghana mm -hmm. to work, you know, in, in, in politics, mm -hmm. because the early promise of the Rawlings regime, mm -hmm. uh, popular expectation of the government, as something mm -hmm. that would uh, deliver some progressive possibilities. Mm -hmm. Many of us young people on the left saw some possibilities. I got my PhD mm -hmm. and I came back and. Uh, for seven years, I worked full time mm -hmm. as a political activist. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first three years, mm -hmm. as one of the national leaders of the national of the defense committee systems that mm -hmm. the regime called uh, into being, mm -hmm. uh, the, the People's and Workers Defense Committees were a kind of mass mobilization vehicle mm -hmm. uh, through which ordinary people try to assert, mm -hmm. you know, their, their their participation and interest, mm -hmm. you know, in the rollings. Uh, the promises of the of the post rollings uh, coup. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were among some of the organizations that were quickly suppressed. Mm -hmm. You know, as the contradictions between the mass <laughs> line, you know, and the orientation of the regime, particularly mm -hmm. when it went to structural adjustments, you know, became very strong. Mm -hmm. And we, the, I spent a lot of my time actually uh, building, working with uh, with workers mm -hmm. in, in Tema, which is the main industrial uh, city outside. Uh, and I was also one of the leaders of the New Democratic Movement, which was one of the you know, several left-wing organizations that supported uh, the, the PNDC regime in that period. Uh, from when we broke with Rawlings at the end of 1984, we continued to work you know, with, with the student movement and also with the, with the unions on precisely the same issues, which have been the basis for their support for, for Rawlings. But those same issues actually became points of conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to joke in those days, you know, that uh, <laughs> the, how, what amounts to deviation is defined by power. Mm -hmm. So that if you continue to follow on the old line, mm -hmm. when the leadership has changed course, mm -hmm. it is not you who has deviated. Mm -hmm. It is not the leadership who has deviated, but you, you, the weak person who still going the straight line, who has yeah. deviated, mm -hmm. you know. So when the regime deviated, we were accused of deviation, you mm -hmm. know, and put in prison and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, you were in prison. Yes. So, in the wake of that, I went back to England to finish my my, my PhD. Mm -hmm. So it was was in England mm -hmm. that these conversations about how to mm -hmm. continue to work politically led to mm -hmm. a group of us, you know, who have been associated in that mm -hmm. period, mm -hmm. deciding to to form the Thermal Network, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a vehicle. So the Thermal Network, in that sense, is not a classic. Mm -hmm. NGO that you find in many African mm -hmm. countries where it's a kind of third employment sector, mm -hmm. okay, because those were who founded it actually could mm -hmm. be doing other things. In fact, mm -hmm. one of the founders became a very senior person, you know, in the African Development Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the founders, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's currently the president of Kodeshra, mm -hmm. uh, and also mm -hmm. one of the founders, mm -hmm. uh, could have he got a first class in law, mm -hmm. could have gone back to teaching the law faculty. Mm -hmm. But we all opted, you know, uh, to to mm -hmm. to set this thing up as a mm -hmm. kind of vehicle for mm -hmm. our political work. So it was very explicitly seen as a chance to exploit the liberalized political space, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, not simply as something to for employment. Mm -hmm. And since then you have been uh, with Third World Network. Yes. And you have uh, created the Africa Trade Network and the African Initiative on Mining, Environment and Society. Can you please elaborate and tell us more about yeah. how you created it? I mean, we, we set up Third World Network, you know, in a sense, again, in, consistent with the, with the, the analysis mm -hmm. of, of the founders. 
I mean, the, we were clear that even though we were setting up in Ghana, mm -hmm. the key challenges mm -hmm. facing Africa's countries and Africa's people mm -hmm. were common. Mm -hmm. And the global regime, mm -hmm. okay, the nature of imperialism, the nature of global power, mm -hmm. the nature of you know global governance mm -hmm. uh, was a very key part, mm -hmm. you know, the challenges mm -hmm. that the continent faced. And therefore, those in, it was important to have an organization which had a Pan-African remit. Mm -hmm. Because you had a situation where, I mean, Africa was and remains the only continent mm -hmm. Where in international meetings you find a special paragraph, mm -hmm. you know, referring to Africa, Africa's special situation. Mm -hmm. And our leaders are always very keen to mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. you know, kind, kind of, of yeah. to claim their victim status, mm -hmm. you know, as a as as a as a kind of strengthening, mm -hmm. you know, the the, 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 the the begging bowl. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know the film Gelwa, in which you know the Gelwa, yeah, where Gelwa. the, the, the yeah. guy says, you know, always yeah. reaching out and collecting yeah. and so on. Mm -hmm. But citizens' voices were very weak mm -hmm. in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And also, there's not enough of an aggregation of mm -hmm. citizens' voices around these things. Mm -hmm. And the issues that people were experiencing mm -hmm. at national level had many common elements, mm -hmm. but not enough sharing mm -hmm. okay, among people who were claiming to be working on these things. Mm -hmm. So, in a certain sense, the TWM project also sought to have a certain element of kind of a, a popular Pan Africanism. Mm -hmm. okay? Recognizing, though, the limits of the NGO as a vehicle for mm -hmm. achieving. You know, for, 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 for doing things because we always were clear that mm -hmm. I mean, the NGO has a vehicle mm -hmm. where you raise money from third parties who may be supportive. Mm -hmm. That way of funding itself defines the limits mm -hmm. of what you can do, even though you can stretch it. So, the Pan African thing was very important for us, and therefore, how do we create the, the mechanisms through which like minded people mm -hmm. could work together? Mm -hmm. How did the Africa Trade Network come to be created? Mm -hmm. The early work of Federal Network Africa was in the latter period of the prominent or popular struggles mm -hmm. against structural adjustment policies. Mm -hmm. So we were very heavily involved in the anti-SAPs, mm -hmm. you know, things across the continent, mm -hmm. you know, the, the global things about SAPs mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. But the as SAPs began to be transformed into more institutionalized policy, mm -hmm. I mean, the creation of the WTO. Uh, represented in 1995, represented a very definite institutionalization of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. you know, in a global treaty, mm -hmm. and uh, where many of the issues of structural adjustment, which have been treated as kind of bilateral relations between countries mm -hmm. and the IMF and World Bank, mm -hmm. were actually now international treaty obligations, mm -hmm. and we felt it was important to retain that Pan-African, mm -hmm. you know, kind of focus. Mm -hmm on this common problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Africa Trade Network represented an attempt to get like-minded people mm -hmm. to see that the struggles around SAPs mm -hmm. had shifted in substance mm -hmm. to a different terrain, but had changed form. Mm -hmm. And we needed to continue to, to engage uh, on that. So that, that's how the ATN mm -hmm. came about. Mm -hmm. I mean, AIMS, similarly, because unlike many activists working on, on extractive issues mm -hmm. who come at it from the perspective of corruption around revenue management mm -hmm. or environmental impact, mm -hmm. all of which are important, mm -hmm. uh, we came to our thing about extractives actually through analysis of global capital flows, mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing about globalization, mm -hmm. you know, in Africa. So trade was one part mm -hmm. of the globalization mm -hmm. framework. Mm -hmm but also capital flows. Mm -hmm. And we ask the question, I mean, what are the primary and the most important forms mm -hmm. in which foreign capital, mm -hmm. you know, uh, is retaining its control mm -hmm. over the African political economy? I mean, foreign direct investment, mm -hmm. as opposed to hot money, mm -hmm. uh, was a lot more important in that period, in addition to aid, of course. And a lot of the hot money was going to extractives. Mm -hmm. So tracking it from a kind of a, a global capital flows perspective, mm -hmm. we came to extractives mm -hmm. as a key site where the whole struggle about control of the continent mm -hmm. was playing out. Mm -hmm. And then from that analysis, then we came to the issue. So what are they? Who are the actors? Who are the beneficiaries? Mm -hmm. Who are the victims? Who are the consequences? Mm -hmm. And again, if you look at the continent, mm -hmm. the same policies have been put in place mm -hmm. around mining. Mm -hmm. 
put a, you know, on the base of the uh, World Bank strategy for Africa mining. Mm -hmm. So countries had similar goals. Mm -hmm. Same companies were operating. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the struggles in country were around impacts. Mm -hmm. Not about the political economy of mining, but about impacts. Mm -hmm. So we felt that m struggling against impacts was important. But if you don't bring a larger political economy perspective to it, mm -hmm. you are likely to be fragmented and not likely to join forces. Mm -hmm. Because that analysis that we brought also that allows you mm -hmm. to see the relationships mm -hmm across national boundaries, mm -hmm. the relationships across social mm -hmm. you know, groups, mm -hmm. and also how you then organize the elements of international solidarity mm -hmm. and cooperation. Mm -hmm. And also the arenas, different arena in which actually mm -hmm. your concerns about mining mm -hmm. you know, can be taken, not simply to human rights spaces mm -hmm. or you know, to areas of environmental issues, but a much more kind of holistic kind of perspective. And this, has tended to be the ways in which we have approached our work mm -hmm. to kind of frame it in ways that will define a common African you know, element, mm -hmm. which then gives us the basis for how we generate pressure mm -hmm. against African governments, how we intervene mm -hmm. you know, in kind of global policy spaces, so that autonomous African expression mm -hmm. of citizens, mm -hmm. as opposed to the kind of ways in which governments want special paragraphs mm -hmm. for Africa, mm -hmm. you know, becomes part also of, of the global discourse about the continent. Mm -hmm. You were just referring to the Pan African, Pan African perspective and the holistic uh, approach that Third World Network is using. And this is not new. Since two, in 2005, you co authored the book with Jimmy Alisina and Adebayo Goshi. And the book was on Africa and development challenges in the new millennium. And you were in particular talking about the new partnership for Africa's development. So, 10 years later, if you have to look back, what is, in your opinion, the meaning of NEPAD today? It's an institution and of NEPAD as a policy mm -hmm. uh, framework. Uh, NEPAD institution is a curious creature, mm -hmm. okay? Nominally part of the African Union Commission's mm -hmm. architecture, mm -hmm. uh, but in many ways autonomous. Mm -hmm. uh, autonomous in ways which are not always beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give an example. Mm -hmm. I mean, NEPAD is the entry point through which promoters of the Natural Resource Charter, mm -hmm. which is really an initiative by some private citizens mm -hmm. in the global north, together with some right-wing you know, academics, are trying to insist that there has to be some global governance framework mm -hmm. for extractives. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this closely linked with the World Bank and so on and so forth. Uh, it's competing with the African Mining Vision, mm -hmm. which is a doc, a policy from adopted by African heads of state. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the AMV status in the uh, in Nepal uh, stable, it's probably on the same level as the as the Natural Resource Charter. Mm -hmm. So it's become this curious, inst you know, institution through which I think a certain kind of a vector for donor entry, mm -hmm. you know, into the you know into the center of, of African uh, policy making. Mm -hmm. NEPAD, the policy framework, in a way has evolved in a, in a disparate mm -hmm. fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, our critique of NEPAD at the time was that a project of continental uh, kind of unity on a development vision mm -hmm. could not be anchored in expectations mm -hmm. of you know, aid, mm -hmm. funding, mm -hmm. and foreign investment. Mm -hmm and the terms of which would simply be an institutionalization of some of the things we complain about mm -hmm. uh, around the structural adjustment. Mm -hmm. So under the, the rubric of NEPAD, a number of initiatives mm -hmm. have taken place of a fairly eclectic uh, uh, kind of uh, character. Mm -hmm. But I think if you look post NEPAD, I think the, the growth spread, mm -hmm. excuse me, that the continent experienced, the 10 year growth period in the, from the early noughties to maybe about 2015, even if you include the, the, the period of the, of the crash, 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. basically has been claimed mm -hmm. by the protagonist of Nepal, mm -hmm. but it has also, that growth has also raised questions mm -hmm. about the model, mm -hmm. uh, because the growth has seen intensified inequality. Mm -hmm. The growth has been driven largely by extractives mm -hmm. 
which has increased the continent's dependence mm -hmm. on commodities mm -hmm. and also highlighted really the limits of that model. Mm -hmm. So what you find currently is really that in a certain sense there are some key initiatives which are taking place on the continent mm -hmm. uh, which reflect the, shall we say, the kind of more progressive agenda mm -hmm. uh, than NEPAD uh, envisaged. Mm -hmm. uh, the recognition, for example, that this continent and, uh, and economies would not go anywhere without structural transformation mm -hmm. and industrialization, mm -hmm. that we should do something about creating jobs, mm -hmm. that we should do something about you know dealing with inequality, mm -hmm. and how these have led to various kind of policy frameworks mm -hmm. at the continental and, and, and regional levels. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go back to the NEPAL document, NEPAL, in a way, tried to marry the, the more radical, uh, early post-colonial vision of Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. with a, a kind of more neoliberal vision mm -hmm. of, uh, of neoliberalism, a more kind of open regionalism thing mm -hmm. about market and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, currently, I would say that the, the, the expectation of a stronger role for the state mm -hmm. has come back in a way that at the time Nepal was formulated, mm -hmm. you know, uh, has, was not the case. Mm -hmm. But having said that, at the same time, we can say that in many countries, domestic policy making is some distance from these grand mm -hmm. continental visions, which have a slightly more radical mm -hmm. uh, kind of agenda, which throw back a bit more mm -hmm. to a recognition that the early post-colonial mm -hmm. period and the policies of that period mm -hmm. were not mistaken, mm -hmm. even if there were mistakes made in how they were implemented. Now the basic analysis mm -hmm. of the of the continent's problems from that period remain valid. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have a fairly eclectic uh, uh, situation, mm -hmm. and you also find, in my view, that in many countries, really, the the excitement about electoral politics mm -hmm. has begun to wane. Mm -hmm. People have seen the limits, mm -hmm. you know, of changing, you know, uh, parties, mm -hmm. which don't really represent any change mm -hmm. uh, in, in direction. So we are at a moment where you have a mix of recognition expressed in some initiatives for a radical agenda of change, a more progressive agenda, which basically challenges the paradigm of neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. But we have a dominance at the domestic levels mm -hmm. of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. both because of the, the, the fact that the, the, the institutional cadre who have been built over the past 30 years mm -hmm. are very much you know, wedded, you know, to that. And of course, also, economies develop their own dynamic, mm -hmm. where kind of new social layers, new economic interests kind of become more prominent. So those who are, have an interest in a different agenda, I think there's been substantial demobilization because of the mechanism of electoral politics driven by patronage and, you know, sectarian considerations based on religion, ethnicity, and so on and so forth, where the parties really are like not policy vehicles. Mm -hmm. They're just periodic vehicles that are called into being on the eve of elections, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so that the, the, the elite can, you know, uh, mm -hmm. alternate, you know, power whilst, you know, policy does not change. So, in, 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 the, in the 10 years since NEPAD, this, in my view, is how the, the policy thing has, has moved. Mm -hmm. Some positive developments, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the, the persistence was on the more mm -hmm. intractable uh, challenges and orientations. Mm -hmm. And we will discuss more about the um, electoral council that you were denouncing mm -hmm. in the rope interview. But now let's focus on Ghana. Uh, you were talking about the disconnect between the kind of international policy making and what is happening at domestic level. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you recall in 2000, the Ghana Vision 2020, which was launched in uh, 1995, targeted for Ghana to be a middle income country within one generation. And uh, in 2010, Ghana rebased its account, its national account, and was considered by the World Bank as having graduated and uh, became a middle income country, low middle income country. So what, in your opinion, since 2011, 2010, that this happened, this rebasement and Ghana becoming a middle income country, what were the implications of this and what concretely has changed? Rama, let's put it this way. <laughs> if you went to sleep, 
the day before the announcement of the rebasing. Mm -hmm. And you woke up the day after. Mm -hmm. And you went around, mm -hmm. you know, and you heard people tell you that Ghana has become a middle income country. Mm -hmm. You rub your eyes mm -hmm. and you ask, how many years have I been asleep? <laughs> because nothing, as you know, statistically, yes. uh, things changed, mm -hmm. but in substance, mm -hmm. not the whole lot changed. Uh, but some things changed in mm -hmm. terms of the ways in which, you know, the elite began to see the country, mm -hmm. see themselves, mm -hmm. evaluate their achievements, mm -hmm. and also begin to make certain kind of policy mm -hmm. choices. Mm -hmm. Because the, the middle income, low and middle income status had consequences mm -hmm. in terms of what kinds of international aid mm -hmm. or capital you can get. Mm -hmm. I mean, certain sources of aid mm -hmm. began to dry up. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that really consistent with the complete absence, in my view, of any strategic vision mm -hmm. for this country. There's any thinking through about what this transition would mean mm -hmm. in terms of you know, resourcing, mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. For a country which, for the preceding 20 years, have been very heavily dependent mm -hmm. you know, on, on, on aid. Mm -hmm. Of course, the rebasing also and the uh, attainment of middle income status came, was aided by the discovery of oil. Mm -hmm. So per capita income went up. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were around in the, from the discovery of oil, the excitement mm -hmm. about what oil meant, mm -hmm. you know, kind of really exaggerated, mm -hmm. you know, proclamations were made. I think President Kufu, who was uh, in office at the time, you know, uh, use a mixed metaphor, mm -hmm. you know, that Ghana will become an African, you know, lion which will fly. You know, <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, and there's a lot of that exaggerated uh, expectation. Mm -hmm. Now, the if you look at what has happened to the economy since, uh, the oil income mm -hmm. has allowed the government to be less dependent mm -hmm. on on donor money. Mm -hmm. uh, but the addition of oil to the country's basket mm -hmm. of exports has meant that Ghana actually mm -hmm. is even more commodity dependent. Mm -hmm. It's not a small basket. Mm -hmm. uh, oil and gold, mm -hmm. okay, and cocoa mm -hmm. represent about almost 80% mm -hmm. of the country's exports. So all you need is a little fluctuation. Mm -hmm. You know, in the prices of these of these uh, uh, commodities. Mm -hmm. If you look at what happened recently with the drop in the oil price mm -hmm. the, and also with gold, mm -hmm. the consequences have been quite far-reaching mm -hmm. in terms of you know the uh, public revenues, mm -hmm. in terms of the country's ability to support its kind of heavy consumption mm -hmm. of imports. A country which is very largely mm -hmm. the industrialized, mm -hmm. uh, agrarian sector where productivity has been stagnant, mm -hmm. you know, for, for a very long time. So we have about 40% plus of the population in the agricultural sector, mm -hmm. but they produce less than 20% of, of the GDP, okay, uh, which is not an unusual pattern, of course, on the continent. So the, the middle income status really doesn't tell you very much. Mm -hmm about the substance, mm -hmm. you know, of the economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, a study that was done uh, in 20, uh, 2013 or 2014 points to 2013, I think, the, the latest Ghana uh, Living Standards Survey. Inequality is worse, mm -hmm. okay? And the, the, the hard core of poverty, mm -hmm. you know, remains kind of very strong. Mm -hmm. And the economy is not, it's not creating jobs. Mm -hmm. So, the middle income thing has not subs has not affected mm -hmm. you know the, 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 the character of the economy and the policy choice we made actually not addressing mm -hmm. this problem at all. If anything, the the, the the modalities of raising money, the country has issued a lot of bonds, mm -hmm. you know, over the years at pretty high, mm -hmm. you know, uh, interest rates. Mm -hmm. uh, there are big questions mm -hmm. about 
how these monies are being used. Mm -hmm. You know, the rebuilding of public debt mm -hmm. and what it represents in terms of, uh, uh, of, of contribution to, to national development. Mm -hmm. So, many issues. Mm -hmm. many and issues. to be cautious with this narrative. And uh, connected to what you just said, you declared in a rope interview recently that the management of the economy has been the Achilles heel of Ghana despite the electoral carousel of the political elite. I was going to provocatively ask is it uh, if this wasn't a rather doom and gloom assessment of your own? <laughs> what is very clear is that you know I mean uh, you're not very other other Africans love Ghana. <laughs> you know you're talking to friends from Senegal, <laughs> DRC, from Uganda and you start complaining, say, hey, 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 stop, stop, stop. Mm. Ghana is wonderful. Mm. And say, I live there. I say, yeah, you live there, but you don't know, you know. <laughs> now, I mean, what has struck me from those conversations is that, okay, on a comparative basis, mm -hmm. there are some things in Ghana which are positive mm -hmm. and are worth working to make sure they are preserved and improved, mm -hmm. okay? But I also think that because of basically the fact that across the continent mm -hmm. you'll be hard put to point to one government, mm -hmm. you know, that you can say makes you happy. Mm -hmm. In that situation, we lower people have lowered mm -hmm. their standards. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So what really we should treat as the flaw mm -hmm. of our expectations mm -hmm. has become the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Of our expectations, mm -hmm. but it's important mm -hmm. not to allow yourself to be overwhelmed by. Mm -hmm. In a way, in a way, it's, it's in a way, it's 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 it's, it's a way of internalizing, mm -hmm. you know, the negativity. Mm -hmm. You're internalizing. And say, okay, if it's well, maybe you know, mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. let's take the fact that Ghana has you know elections without too much violence, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. are so great that we should be happy about it. Mm -hmm. That is true. But let's just return to the question about the. I mean, Ghana has had steady growth mm -hmm. since the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. Now, that is important mm -hmm. because one of the things about Ghana in the late 70s was that Ghana had one of the fastest declining economies in the world. Mm -hmm. Within a decade, the economy has shrunk by 25%. As a result of mismanagement, mm -hmm. as a result of you know kind of a commodity price questions mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So when the economy started growing, it was an important shift mm -hmm. away from a negative. Mm -hmm. But the structural issues that face this economy, mm -hmm. in terms of its say integrated character, mm -hmm. its ability to create jobs mm -hmm. and sustainable livelihoods. Mm -hmm haven't changed mm -hmm. kind of fundamentally. Mm -hmm. And Ghana became a model mm -hmm. in the eighties, late eighties, mm -hmm. basically for restoration mm -hmm. of colonial type economies. Mm -hmm. So the growth has been powered by the rebuilding of the old export mm -hmm. sectors. Mm -hmm. I mean Ghana talks the, the, the governments talk constantly about how Ghana, you know, is planning to, you know, hit one million tons. Mm -hmm you know, in cocoa production and remain there. So I'm asking, but, you know, we're importing 200 million uh, CDs mm -hmm. of 200 million dollars mm -hmm. of poultry, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And we are aspiring to produce 1 million tons of, mm -hmm. of, of so the, the, even So there's, a, there's, there's a, a commodity dependence trap mm -hmm. in the minds of the elite, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, you take oil. Ghana's oil is not it's not Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. quantity to put it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's the same quantity as Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And yet when you talk to many Africans, they think Ghana's oil is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And many of them don't know that Cameroon is an oil producer. Mm -hmm. It's all part of the Ghanaian, <laughs> the, the exaggeration, mm -hmm. you know, of the, of the, of the, of the Ghanaian model. Mm -hmm. And the oil thing has led to a complete frenzy mm -hmm. and also therefore a, a movement away from a more systematic uh, kind of uh, approach mm -hmm. to, to trying to transform the economy. And both main parties mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. are committed to that. They are more interested in keeping the foreign investor happy mm -hmm. 
than in what they are going to, the, the risk they will take mm -hmm. to make, to move this economy away from mm -hmm. uh, community independence, mm -hmm. to try and do some, to build more seriously mm -hmm. around, you know, regional integration mm -hmm. so that we are solving, you know, the problems together. Mm -hmm. So, this is basically what, what I meant. Mm -hmm. um, it is not doom and gloom, but that, that's, the, that's the, the reality from which you have to start. Mm -hmm. that if you took either the NDC, which is now in power, mm -hmm. or the NPP, which is uh, in opposition, mm -hmm. and which could come back to power mm -hmm. you know, with the next election, fundamentally, over the past 20 plus years, mm -hmm. when they've alternated, mm -hmm. they've not been uh, kind of you know, very, very, very different. Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, recently, we took the government on in respect of a new contract they gave to one of the big mining companies, Google Fields. They gave them some new tax concessions. Those terms are completely legal. Mm -hmm. But they defend it because we need to, you know, keep the mines working and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean these are not renewable resources. Mm -hmm. If you want you go to illegality to keep a company going, mm -hmm. then you might as well make it a free fall. Mm -hmm. There's a big discussion now about the privatization of the electricity corporation of Ghana. Mm -hmm. The president was on, on in the media recently, making some vast pronouncements about the need to take risk and, you know, basically set up some strong men mm -hmm. to attack those of us who are critical of the mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. But when you look closely at what they are offering, mm -hmm. they are ready to offer a foreign company guarantees for their profitability, mm -hmm. guarantees for the payment mm -hmm. of, of utility bills by public entities, mm -hmm. which the government did not offer. Mm -hmm to the publicly owned electricity corporation of Ghana, mm -hmm. which contributed to the collapse of the company. Mm -hmm. And yet they will offer that to a foreign company, mm -hmm. which will then be successful. They say, ah, you see, mm -hmm. publicly owned, locally managed, mm -hmm. not good. Mm -hmm. Foreign, private, best. Mm -hmm. So these guys are complicit mm -hmm. in even creating a climate mm -hmm. of doubt about our own ability mm -hmm. to manage our affairs. Mm -hmm. So how can change happen in this context when we keep struggling? <laughs> they are talking about uh, resilience and having uh, home ground strategies and so on, and not relying on on domestic companies to do to uh, operate this change. I mean, you need to keep making the same points mm -hmm. in as many contexts as possible. Mm -hmm. You need to keep building alliances. Mm -hmm around the issues mm -hmm. as they arise, mm -hmm. okay? And in, in our experience as Taiwan Network, even though we may not claim big victories, mm -hmm. I mean, there are many positive lessons mm -hmm. from what we work. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you take the work that we've done, for example, around trade policy, mm -hmm. you take the work we've done around the economic partnership agreements, mm -hmm. you know, with, 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 with allies in the Africa Trade Network. Mm -hmm. I mean, the EPA should have been signed like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. 2007. Mm -hmm. We are still here. Mm -hmm. It's still drawn out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a combination of the fact that people campaigned, mm -hmm. raised awareness about the, the negative implications mm -hmm. of the EPS for our development space. But in the process also, build alliances. Mm -hmm. People in the technocracy, mm -hmm. people in political office, mm -hmm. and people in the, in the private sector, mm -hmm. as well as people in, in popular organizations like the union. Mm -hmm. you know, people in faith-based organizations and so on and so forth. And in different situations, you find different permutations mm -hmm. of those. Mm -hmm. So in, in Ghana here, in, in that process, one of the interesting alliances that we developed was with the Poultry Farmers you know, Association. Mm -hmm. And the Poultry Farmers, in a way, are an interesting organization because they represent, they are in an industry which has many positives, mm -hmm. potential positives, that if you increase your domestic poultry production, mm -hmm. you don't only reduce imports mm -hmm. and free or foreign exchange to do other things. Mm -hmm. You also create an industry which has a lot of linkages, mm -hmm. okay? So people producing cereals mm -hmm. and other inputs for feed mm -hmm. would have a bigger market. Mm -hmm. You increase your you also then have your agro-processing. Mm -hmm. But with a certain scale, you can begin to process, mm -hmm. you know, so those producing packaging and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. The people who now are using their, their, their networks mm -hmm. to sell imported, you know, uh, frozen uh, chicken can 
begin to move around, mm -hmm. more people can have, can eat mm -hmm. local chicken. Mm -hmm. There are nutrition things you can do. Mm -hmm. So they have proposals about uh, how eggs could be incorporated in the national school feeding program, one egg a day for each mm -hmm. child and so on. So if we just see the multipliers, mm -hmm. because jobs are created. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now they didn't start from there. Mm -hmm. But as the conversations war and they move from their concern about we want a poultry industry that survives. Mm -hmm. They began to see the trade you know, linkages. Mm -hmm. People in the Association of Ghana Industry mm -hmm. who are used to sitting quietly in the corner with the government and saying, please, we beg, you know, can you mm -hmm. help us? They began to see that they too could begin to kind of raise their voices you know, in policy and so on. And all those things contribute in different ways to transforming the culture of citizenship. Mm -hmm. Because one of the reasons why things are not happening mm -hmm. is that it's not that people can't see it's not that people are not unhappy mm -hmm. by the way things are going. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the culture mm -hmm. around power mm -hmm. in many of our countries, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. people just, it's a kind of a reflex of deference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're talking to people in, uh, in, in mining communities and they can analyze their problem very sharply, mm -hmm. what they want, but what do they want to do? They want to write a petition to the minister mm -hmm. when their rights have been violated. Mm -hmm. Okay, I said no. You have constitutional rights, mm -hmm. which are being valid. Demand respect for your rights. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different thing mm -hmm. from, from petition. So even the ideologies mm -hmm. around power mm -hmm. and accountability, mm -hmm. those are all things which mm -hmm. are part of the baggage, you know. And as you know, I mean, shifting ideas mm -hmm. represent one of the most difficult challenges mm -hmm. because all around you on a daily basis, mm -hmm. dominant ideas are being you know, uh, kind of reinforced. So, but when I look back at the work that we've done, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm quite happy mm -hmm. uh, about some of the things that we've been able to do and the relationships that we've built and also some of the lessons mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, we've, uh, we've learned. Mm -hmm. And you can also even examine the failures mm -hmm. and see that within that also mm -hmm. are the seeds of being able to do better the next time. Mm -hmm. oh. And what has been your role with the income? The National uh, Mining Commission? Yeah, the, the National Coalition of Mining Coalition. was created in 2001, mm -hmm. okay, uh, by a group of uh, three or four organizations mm -hmm. who started on being concerned mm -hmm. about the government's plan mm -hmm. to give away parts of the forest reserves mm -hmm. to mining companies mm -hmm. to explore for gold. Mm -hmm. So the initial thing was, you know, a campaign against you know, uh, stopping the opening up of forest reserves mm. to mining companies. Mm. The campaign was successful mm. because in the end, the areas that were opened up were only the ones in respect of which they are already getting permits. Mm. So we represented less than 1% mm. of what could have been opened up. Mm. But out of that, the organization had already been working together. So it, it, it seemed to make sense mm. that we should have a, a kind of a standing uh, uh, organization. So the coalition came into being and TWN acts as the secretariat mm -hmm. of, of the national coalition mm -hmm. and currently involves a range of NGOs mm -hmm. and you know community organizations from mm -hmm. the main uh, mining mm -hmm. uh, areas. And the coalition, when we started, the main interlocutors mm -hmm. on behalf of citizens when it came to mining policies were chiefs. Mm -hmm state institutions mm -hmm. didn't do business mm -hmm. with uh, community groups or NGOs. Uh, but in the period since, not only has the coalition itself be, become a, a recognized and visible voice you know, in debates and struggles around mining, mm -hmm. but also the individual organizations also mm -hmm. have gained you know, a foothold. And I, I can say quite confidently that the National Coalition of Mining has been central mm -hmm. to changing the discourse on mining and the perception of mining. Mm -hmm. Because when we started working on mining, I mean, it was easy for the government to claim that anybody was critical of policy, mm -hmm. was trying to drive away foreign investment. Mm -hmm. But the discussion now is on a completely different footing, mm -hmm. you know, and some of the changes that the government uh, uh, implemented uh, in the, about 2010, 2011, in terms of taxation and so on, came out of that the pressures that the, the, the coalition and, and its members have been generating. In almost all the mining areas now, 
the companies take more seriously you know, the, the, the demands of, of local communities. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean there are no problems. Mm -hmm. There's still many, many problems. Mm -hmm. But the, the way, the, the relationships, you know, actually there's a, there's a confidence, mm -hmm. you know, about, about making demands, you know, which uh, it, 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 it's real. I mean, we, there's a film that was made last year, mm -hmm. which you can find on the TWN Africa website, yes, which I eloquently it. tells you how the I people know, see it. what mm -hmm. difference the, the coalition has made their lives. Maybe to end on a positive note, what do you think of the recent decision of Ghana to facilitate the entry requirements for African Union citizens? No, I think I think it's a positive, you know, uh, development. Mm -hmm. It's a positive development, mm -hmm. uh, which hopefully uh, can be built on. Uh, of course, in ECOWAS, we move around, mm -hmm. you know, freely. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know just how useful that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but that problem remains a very big one. And if the Ghana government can follow up its decision mm -hmm. with becoming a champion mm -hmm. for that change, mm -hmm. you know, it will be quite positive. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, this is a country where one of the many legacies of Nkrumah, mm -hmm. you know, is around this African, mm -hmm. you know, identity. Mm -hmm. So even the most right-wing Ghanaian government mm -hmm. starts off wanting to deny that, but ends up as it goes around discovering mm -hmm. that actually part of the reason why they have credibility and status mm -hmm. on the continent is because of the traditions mm -hmm. of Ghanaian foreign policy mm -hmm. and this Pan-African component. And so, mm -hmm. so I think it's an important mm -hmm. initiative and if the Ghana government can become a champion of that mm -hmm. in other areas. Mm -hmm. And also on the back of that, began to see Pan-Africanism, regional integration as a pillar mm -hmm. of the country's development strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay, not simply as a, something offered to individual citizens mm -hmm. moving across, but that, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 our countries cannot, mm -hmm. just cannot individually mm -hmm. develop. There are many things that if we coordinate, mm -hmm. we'll all be the much better for it. Mm -hmm. Even our elite mm -hmm. might discover that actually, mm -hmm. you know, being able to export to Senegal, mm -hmm. okay, or buy from Senegal, mm -hmm. it's better business mm -hmm. than buying from France or from buying from the, from the US. Mm -hmm. We have a situation where now if I want to, as a business person, want to ship stuff mm -hmm. across West Africa, because all our national shipping lines have collapsed, we have to transit through Europe. Really? You know, yes, Yeah. because if the ship is going from here to, to you know, if you come to, to pick the load and you don't have space to take it to, let's say, to, to Lagos, you have to take it to Holland and find a ship which is going to come to Nigeria. You know, so the, the, the disintegration takes many, many forms. And it's only that it cost me four CDs a minute mm -hmm. to call Senegal. Mm -hmm. And it cost me nothing to call the US. Okay? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the visa thing is just a tip of mm -hmm. the bigger thing that we need to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it just to end, to wrap up, what are you currently working on? What are the current projects and future projects? And uh, Third World Network has always had this uh, Pan-Africanist but also Global South perspectives. How do you cooperate with the other offices, teams of Third World Network and what are your projects? Yes. Um, we define our work in kind of three yearly uh, cycles mm -hmm. and uh, the issues of trade and investment, mm -hmm. extractives, mm -hmm. gender and economic policy have been constants of our work. Mm -hmm. but now with a framing thing about you know uh, structural transformation with equity mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the kind of theme mm -hmm. under which we are working mm -hmm. we also are looking at the issue of finance mm -hmm. you know and uh, the agrarian industrialization mm -hmm. kind of nexus to have a complete portfolio mm -hmm. around structural transformation mm -hmm. we decided to intervene in the to, to frame our work around structural transformation equity because mm -hmm. Everybody now is talking about structural transformation, mm -hmm. which is important. Mm -hmm. But even within that convergence, mm -hmm. there's a contestation mm -hmm. about what will be the particular mm -hmm. emphasis, the particular approach. Because structural transformation, as we've seen in other places, has mm -hmm. no guarantee mm -hmm. equitable outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can have pretty kind of heavily unequal mm -hmm. uh, kind of outcomes. Mm -hmm. There's no guarantee that the, the, the choices will be primarily for the benefits, you know, of the people. Mm -hmm. There's no guarantee that a 
Pan African regionalist dimension, you know, will be part of it. Mm -hmm. All those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we have taken the structural transformation equity as a frame mm -hmm. around within which we are going to work, mm -hmm. so as to to harvest the continuities of our work over the past. Mm -hmm. Because for a long time, the work that we did, uh, shall we say, had a largely defensive mm -hmm. dimension. Africa has been battered by structural adjustment policies. Mm -hmm. So you want to minimize mm -hmm. the impact. Mm -hmm. The WTO has been created mm -hmm. and it's trying to take away policy space. Mm -hmm. So you want to minimize mm -hmm. how much policy That's space mm -hmm. is being lost. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, structural adjustment has certain impacts, you know, gendered impacts. Mm -hmm. So you do gender and economy reforms in Africa projects mm -hmm. to try and see what you can do about mm -hmm. it. With a discussion about structural transformation, mm -hmm. you actually have effective a positive agenda. Mm -hmm. A positive framework within which everybody is agreed. Mm -hmm. So we move away from defensive to say now, mm -hmm. what can we do mm -hmm. to carry forward this agenda of change? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so that is the way we frame our work. So in an area like, uh, say, the extractives, mm -hmm. from the late uh, late two thousands, we've been working a lot around the African mining vision. Mm -hmm. But we were very actively involved in the in the, in the agenda of the. Mm -hmm. Africa uh, Mining Mission. I was one of the people who worked on the report, a group called the International Study Group, and we defined mm -hmm. the orientations, the policy orientations for the African Mining Mission. And Tito Nen is very heavily involved in that. Mm -hmm. So rather than simply talking now about impacts, mm -hmm. there are actually now policies on the table. Which how do we respond mm -hmm. to impacts? The issue then is to make sure governments mm -hmm. pick these ones up. Mm -hmm. Trade, there's a continental free trade area, mm -hmm. which claims that if implemented, will be good for structural adjustment. But we look at it and say, no, this thing is defective. Mm -hmm. So it's good we are discussing a continental approach mm -hmm. to trade in a global context. Mm -hmm. But some things need to be in place. So those are the kinds of, mm -hmm. you know, trying to work within the, the positive agenda and also bringing the other elements mm -hmm. uh, which are important for the structural transformation thing. And of course, the question of constituencies. Mm -hmm. Who has an interest in a certain kind of structural transformation? Mm -hmm. Which classes, mm -hmm. gender issues, mm -hmm. you know, impact and so on. We're trying to it's 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 a in a certain sense, for more than twenty years there's a certain pushing back. Mm -hmm. But now the agreement that we need to move away from commodity dependence represents an escape for the paradigm mm -hmm. created by neoliberalism mm -hmm. historically. Mm -hmm. But that agreement at the level of vision mm -hmm. hasn't quite, it's nowhere near yet becoming policy. Mm -hmm. But to be able to work on it in that way mm -hmm. represents an important shift that we are quite happy to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to grapple with. Mm -hmm. And just a final question, at the personal level, mm -hmm. how difficult or how easy is it to still be that uh, firm or tough activist after so many years? Do, do you sometimes face situations in which you reflect about your own background and are there things you would have changed? I mean, there's, there's, <laughs> there's no one who doesn't have regrets, mm -hmm. you know, who doesn't have doubts. Uh, not too long ago, I was watching the evening news on mm -hmm. Ghana TV, mm -hmm. you know, with my son who is now 20. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and something came up and, you know, I can't express some exasperation. Mm -hmm. So he asked me that, degree, you know, all my friends call me Degray. Degray. Said, yeah, from Daniel Graham. Okay. So when I bought in school, they came Dean Gray. Okay. Uh, Degray, don't you feel at times that you wasted your life? You know. So I said, why do you say that? I said, well, you know, all these things I've been fighting, same things are still happening, and so on. So we had a very interesting conversation, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. about change, how change mm -hmm. happens, how do you evaluate it, how do you take mm -hmm. failure and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But it was something that focused my mind mm -hmm. because he lives in a, an environment where both parents mm -hmm. are going on all the time about the need for yes. things to be better mm -hmm. and this and that. And yet he sits back and poses this question mm -hmm. and it's a question I ask all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could have come back to be teaching law in mm -hmm. the law faculty mm -hmm. and maybe by now I'll be a law professor. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have become a full-time lawyer, mm -hmm. probably be running a big corporate practice with mm -hmm. a lot of money, you know, in my pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would be too first And not a politician? And also I could have stayed in <laughs> politics mm -hmm. because this ruling NBC, mm -hmm. 
basically has been created, you know, on the backs of mm -hmm. all the hundreds of thousands of workers mm -hmm. that we mobilized them in the 80s, mm -hmm. who had great expectations, mm -hmm. you know, of Jerry Rollins, who been betrayed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, there are many good friends, mm -hmm. old friends of mine mm -hmm. who are still in the party, mm -hmm. you know, who are, you know, we chat, mm -hmm. but we diverged, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, so, but for me, the, the thing about this work is that as I go around, I get a lot of reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Whether it's somebody who stops me in a shop, and so, you know, Dr. Graham, I was watching this program on TV, you know, and I really liked, you know, what, what you said, you see, because these are the things that somebody else would say. On one hand, I wish people like him mm -hmm. were more active. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it makes me believe that actually there's a, there's, there's a resonance that this thing connects mm -hmm. with very large constituency. Mm -hmm. And periodically, you get the eruptions mm -hmm. of people saying exactly the same things. Mm -hmm. Periodically, you get some breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Okay, like when in 2008, I was invited to give the keynote speech at the, uh, at the ministerial mm -hmm. meeting, many ministers meeting, which adopted the the, the African mining mission. I was asking myself, this can't be real. Mm -hmm. Because a few years ago, we've been condemned, you know, as subversives. Mm -hmm. But here I am, people want to hear what we have to say. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I was involved in drafting the resolution, mm -hmm. you know, and putting in things about the connection between trade and this and that. Mm -hmm. You know, you get those breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. Now, we haven't quite moved to policy, but the fact that those things are there mm -hmm. means that there's a certain mm -hmm. kind of breakthrough. It's mm -hmm. a tough business, mm -hmm. you know. But look, Rama, the thing is that all of us, Unless you are depressed, mm -hmm. okay, we are kind of spontaneous optimists mm -hmm. because each morning we get out of bed mm -hmm. believing that we can do something mm -hmm. before the sun goes down. Mm -hmm. So we keep trying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and on this word of optimism, and uh, we would like to thank you. I would like to thank you for accepting uh, to have this interview and having us in your office. We really appreciate it. You are such an inspiration and it's a pleasure meeting you again. And thank you a lot for your time, you. for your availability, and we hope to be staying in that rhythm. Thank you. Yeah, good luck. Thank you.